you know We all want to change the world So who was here three years ago in Santa Clara when James Curley from Levi's came on stage with those words? Yeah, how about a round of applause for what you've done for the last three years? See, when we talk about our new theme here, Play Greener, engaging fans, athletes, and communities, that's how we change the world. Yes, we need to walk the walk, and as the Alliance and you all have done for many years before that, greening your venues is a necessary step, but it's not sufficient. If you really want to have impact, you need to talk the talk as well, and that's what we're here to talk about this summit. Before we begin, since this is a sporting event, even though it's a conference, we're in this wonderful LEED Platinum 100% solar-powered Golden One Center. It's a sports event. We're a sports organization. So what do all good sporting events start with in America? The national anthem. Please help me welcome Ariana, one of the Sacramento Kings dancers and a member of the NBA All-Star Dance Team to sing the national anthem. Please stand. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave? Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariana. Wow. Now that's the way to start a sports conference. So good evening and welcome to the seventh annual Green Sports Alliance Summit. My name is Joe Kerala. I'm the founder and CEO of Green Bear Group and the strategic partner and founding partner of the Alliance since before we launched. And I have the pleasure of being your MC for this summit. So what are we here to talk about? Well, engaging people, and what does that mean? Our theme is play greener. You walk the walk, we wanna talk the talk and use the market influence. We understand all of that. But in order to do that, we had to do a bit of a pivot. Most of you have been with us for several years. And as you know, as a trade association, we were very internally focused. We served our members. We shared insights. We promoted best practices. We convened people together. And we did the foundational work, the greening and the operational work. And now we need to do that and more. We now need to build that demo house on top of that foundation. We need to be able to let people look in and see what we're doing, and most importantly, we need to look outward and project out to people what they can be doing, how they can emulate what their favorite sports teams and athletes are doing on their own and take it one step further. That's impact. So while we're here, we want you to listen. We want you to share. 
We want, to take, want you to take away something and use it, and we want you to have fun. After all, it is a sports event. So a quick overview of activities already done. Climate and Sports Summit, huge today. Breakout tours earlier this morning, more tomorrow. Thought Leadership Forum, big success again, and of course, the Women's Sports and the Environment Symposium. Every single one of these well attended with great success. And the bottom line for all of these, the thing we learned, the thing we took away, the thing we shared, the thing you all learned from each other, is wherever you are, it doesn't matter. What matters is can you do a little better? Can you play greener? First, I'd like to acknowledge some of our sponsors who helped make the day of service possible, who came together with us on Sunday. Those sponsors include Connor Sports, Excel Dryer, NatureWorks, the NHL, Recover, and partners such as Cornflower Farms, Keep California Beautiful, and Sacramento State, Vivek Ranadive, the Sacramento Kings, and Golden One Center our hosts here in this awesome building. You're going to hear me say that a few times. This is unbelievable. Sacramento City Unified School District, the USGBC, and the USGBC Northern California chapter. It was a great day of sweating and more sweating, and some people said they lost 10 pounds out there and campus projects, planting flowers, native plants, etc. And then, of course, the Pac-12 Sustainability Conference yesterday right here in Golden One Center consistent with its reputation as the Conference of Champions, the Pac-12, the first to convene an NCAA high-level symposium focused on sustainability. Then, of course, the Kings were kind enough to include the Green Sports Alliance in your annual golf invitational, which was my personal favorite, not because I was any good. In fact, I think we didn't use any of the shots that I took in my foursome but because it represents one of the Alliance's campaigns. And this is something you're going to hear over and over this weekend, so pay attention. No longer is it good enough in this world, and certainly not with us in the Alliance, and we know it's not good enough for you guys to have one-off events. That doesn't work. Year-round activation is what's necessary to keep every movement going forward, every business profitable, every venue filled with events. And so campaigns are what's essential, and for us, it involved both the greening of the event, thanks to some great work by the Kings with a little bit of advice from the Alliance, and also importantly, the greening of the golf course by Michael Peabody and the Granite Bay folks over the last several years. And you'll hear about both of those attributes tomorrow morning with a little video. So that was fun, we had a great day. I mean, it, it's tough to argue with 85 degrees and sunny on a beautiful golf course and get counted to be working. For a bit of housekeeping, please follow us on hashtag green sports and hashtag play greener. And of course, our handle is at Sports Alliance. Now, I'd like to thank our very special presenting sponsor and host. And please, a big round of applause, the Sacramento Kings and Golden One Center. well-deserved. Other outstanding organizations that make the summit possible include ABM, Connor Sports, Coors Light, Corning, Green Bear Group, Nature Works, and Philips Lighting. And a fun new element for 2017, be, please be sure to visit the Coors Light Sports Bar. I mean, isn't that about time we have a, a sports bar at this? Grab a Coors Light, a Blue Moon, whatever you like. And Coors, you know, has been a pioneer since the aluminum can. They've been a leader in sustainable brewing. They continue this rich tradition, including a program called Everyone Can, a program that underscores the sustainable commitment everyone can make to reduce environmental impact through grills made with retired kegs, coolers and umbrellas made with vinyl ads, and more and more. So this year, they launched Everyone Can, a new nationwide program built on the principle that everyone from brewers 
to consumers can and should strive to practice environmental stewardship. So we invite you to swing by the Coors Light Deck located outside and you'll find three drink tickets in your packets awaiting for you. All disposable service wear items used during the summit, these are compostable, part of the King's commitment to the food program, the 10-point food program that's so revolutionary in this country and around the world. We have waste stations throughout the building. If you find any items that are outside items that aren't recyclable, please use the TerraCycle bins available for the disposal of those items. And then in addition, through the help of the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, one of our great partners here at the Green Sports Alliance, the Change the Course program, we're balancing the water footprint of the summit and supporting the Sacramento River wetlands. A big thank you to Blue Media and Seeds for our sustainable printing partners for the summit and to Clean Canteen and Neela for providing reusable tumblers. All right, so that's enough. You're not here to hear the MC talk. You're here to hear great stories, to be inspired. I want to bring up a fabulous storyteller, but before I do, I'd like you all to watch this very brief video courtesy of our friends at NASCAR Green. Thank you for the drum roll. Oh, how disappointing. Okay. We don't have that right now. If there's any way that we can have it for tomorrow, we'll bring it back out. Instead, I would just like you to put your hands together and welcome with me Justin Zellner, Executive Director of the Green Sports Alliance. Okay, I'm not too sure what that was, but tomorrow it'll be more exciting. So I'm here to talk to you about three things. Defining moments, interconnectivity, and trailblazers. Most of you that know me know that there's a couple of defining moments in my life, and I talk about defining moments in the context of these moments in time that define who you are give you a choice to make a decision in life and move on. Those two that you know a lot about me is that I worked for the ski industry and I watched climate change decimate that industry and it gave me the opportunity to pause for a moment and realize there was something bigger for me to do which led me down this pathway that is here in front of you today on this stage. Another major defining moment in my life is sitting right here in the front row and his name is Emmett, and he's five years old. If you want to stand up. <laughs> Sitting next to him is my lovely daughter, Addie, who you'll see t uh, tomorrow. But Emmett was born about five and a half months early. As you can tell, he's doing really well. And that was another defining moment, a true test of character for me to realize after spending six and a half months in the hospital, who am I? What do I represent? What am I all about? Those that know those two defining moments do not know about the next one. In 1990, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Dr. and Professor Amit Goswami at the University of Oregon. Those of you who don't know who Dr. Goswami is, he is the leading quantum physicist on our planet. I was a business major, and I took every single physics course I could take, every single science course I could take from Professor Amit Goswami. And what he taught me about quantum theory was a defining moment in my lifetime. And more importantly than collective consciousness and the whole world trying to think about it at the smallest level and what we can do when we think about character and when we think about observation, the thing that I learned the most was interconnectivity that we are all interconnected. And those of you in the environmental movement talk about this a lot. And from the physicist viewpoint, it gives a perspective of how things evolve and how things are connected and what we, did, what we all need to do in order to create change. 
When Emmett was born, I immediately ran that night to my phone and I watched all these lectures online by Professor Ami Goswami because it reminded me of that interconnectivity and that things were going to be okay. Thirty some years later, I had a conversation just last week with Professor Ami Goswami and I asked him, I was curious about his viewpoint on climate change. From a quantum physicist standpoint, what's your view on climate change? And he gave me a very simple three answers. First, from his scientific viewpoint, this planet is in trouble. He agrees with the other scientists globally. Second, he said that what you could learn from us is that the individuals are not actually those that can define this great movement that you all represent, but it's more about what the movement could do for its people. If your movement could do one thing, it's to teach everybody that you are interconnected. That once you figure that out, that once you realize that, that your actions actually matter and it connects to everybody else, you will finally get to that point where the tipping point we talk about where people will start creating the right actions. So I'm using that. That's another defining moment for me. Trailblazers. Let's talk about that for a second. What's a trailblazer, a pioneer? You are all pioneers. You are all, are all helping us with this movement. And for that, I appreciate it, and you should feel extremely good for that. Tonight, we're gonna be hearing from another trailblazer. In 1977, he represented what the Trailblazers were all about and won an NBA championship in Portland, still the only championship that we've won. And I've got a little bit of a story for you. And the bill, this one's for you. The year was 2002. It was April 14th. Those of you who know me know that I worked for the Portland Trailblazers and we were playing the Lakers. Those of you here from the Kings Foundation, you'll notice there's a banner up there in 2002, it was a great year for them. And they ran into another a buzzsaw that the Trailblazers ran into called the Lakers, unfortunately. But at this game on April 14th, 2002, we were about midway through the third quarter, if I recall, or the third period, if I recall correctly, and we had Scottie Pippen on, on our team. And he has won six rings, NBA rings, and he, got ejected from the game. It was his second technical of the, of the, of the night. Bill's chomping over there. He's, he's, I think he's remembering this. So, Scottie Pippen, true character, a pioneer of the sports um, movement itself, and he walks out, kind of similar to this wedge over here you see, he walks out and he decides he's so upset about what's going on, he grabs this tray and he flings it all the way across the court. And they, you know, everybody's booing because this, this technical foul was ridiculous and nobody could believe everything. And from the rafters, a sea of these things are coming down from the 300 level and people are picking it up and throwing it down and pretty soon on the floor, there is about a foot and a half full of these things that are just coming all over the place. These things, and I happen to have one right here, it's a Beanie Baby, a Bill Walton baby, Beanie Baby to be in fact. <laughs> the most handsome Beanie Baby we ever had. And for those of you in the industry, you know projectiles are terrible because of this one very, very rare reason. So Bill, this one's marked 51 of 20,000. I think all 20,000 ended up on the floor that, that, that evening. But actually, Beverly Ross, our housekeeping operations person at the time, actually picked this up. This was the first one that fell. So for you, my friend, there you go. Okay, enough for me. I'm excited to see you all. This is gonna be a great couple of days. Thank you for being here. And in true pioneer, uh, fashion. I'd like to bring another pioneer out to this stage and the person that really has been behind this beautiful building, this wonderful facility, an ecologically innovative and probably one of the most advanced buildings on the planet. And that's Chris Granger, the president of the Sacramento Kings.
welcome, my friend. Hey, everybody, good evening. Welcome to Sacramento. Welcome to beautiful Golden One Center. I could talk about Golden One Center all night long, and you'll hear me do so over the course of the next few days. But I have, first of all, I need to introduce my favorite mayor in the world because he has a city council meeting in like five minutes, and if I don't get him up on stage, he's going to strangle me. So with that, can you give a rousing Sacramento round of applause for Mayor Daryl Steinberg? <laughs> He always takes my time. It's BS. Darn it. I will, I will cede the majority of the time, but I, I just want to begin with this. It has always been my dream as a hopeful athlete to be standing at center court, the fans in the stands, and this is my moment right now. So... That other fantasy I don't think will ever come true. Maybe if I talk to Vladi a little bit, a little bit more. I came today um, happily late to the city council meeting, not too late, because we do have some important business tonight, like how we're going to develop our great riverfront in Sacramento, the next great, the next great chapter, to say thank you and to tell a short story. To say, to say thank you to the kings, to the visionary leadership of Vivek Ranadive, to his team, Matina and Chris, and all who helped make this beautiful place possible. And Justin was talking a moment ago and thank you to the Green Sports Alliance about defining moments in life. And this building and what led to this building is a defining moment for the community that I am privileged to represent as mayor of Sacramento. There are so many reasons why it's a defining moment. We saved the Kings. How about that? And we're on our way now, especially after last Thursday night, to great days ahead for the team that we love. And as much as I'm a sports fan, I'm a public leader. And I always said that while saving the Kings was sort of existential, it was, none of it would have happened had we not been able to accomplish that, there was something even more significant about what the community accomplished here. They showed and we showed that we could grow our economy, that we could begin to create a destination city, and we could do so in a way that was not only consistent with, but enhanced our environmental values. And that's what the Green Sports Alliance, as I understand it, is about. That's what the Kings are about, and that's what Sacramento is about. And so whether you point to the fact that we're the only arena, I believe, in the country to have been designated platinum in terms of our environmental sustainability, that's an applause line, by the way. Whether it's that we're funded, a, that we are in the world, whether it's that we, our energy is 100% solar, whether, it's all the, whether all the food is brought here from within 150 miles, whether, all the, whether it's the fact that all the food vendors are in fact local restaurateurs and local businesses, whether it's the fact that 98% of the building materials have been recycled for productive use. I'm leaving out half of it. But there's another piece of this that I had a little bit of involvement with that I think tells an important part of the story. You see, we intentionally wanted to build this arena downtown, not just because we saw this as the catalyst for downtown revitalization, 
But we also knew that building an arena downtown, two blocks from an intermodal rail station, along the light rail line, allowing people to walk from work to the concert or the ball game, was essential if we were going to be consistent with being the capital city of the greenest state in the country. For we passed a number of landmark laws in California. AB 32, the most aggressive climate change legislation in the world. In 2007, before I became president of the Senate, I authored a pretty big bill itself, SB 375, which changed the planning paradigm in California. Because it said that we ought to spend our billions of dollars that we have in transportation infrastructure investments only on those projects that help get people out of their cars. Only on projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled. Only on projects that allow people to walk from home to work or from work to where we play. And it's changed the planning paradigm in the state and in the local community. So when it came time to, to deciding, for Vivek to decide, for the city to decide, where should this arena be built? There was really only one true choice, and it's where we stand here today. But in order to assure that this arena could get built with minimal delay, with minimal delay, I had to go to the legislature in my second to last year as president of the Senate and ask the legislature to make a slight modification to a very important law, the California Environmental Quality Act. This is the act which requires appropriately that the public be allowed to weigh in on the environmental impacts of any project. Sometimes it's also used in an excuse, as an excuse by project opponents to stop a project or to delay it indefinitely. And the NBA told the VEC, and they told me, and they told Chris, they told Medina, they told all of us, if you don't get this arena built within a very short period of time, we will in fact allow the team to move to Seattle or elsewhere. So here was the interesting issue, and I'll conclude in just a moment. We had to convince the legislature to prohibit anyone who wanted to sue under the California Environmental Quality Act from being able to sue and stop the project. In other words, we had to modify the most important environmental act in the country in order to ensure that we could build the most environmentally conscious arena in the country. And I simply asked the question, as did the kings, why wouldn't we change the law modestly to assure that we could build a project that was consistent with the environmental law itself? And that's exactly what we did here. It took a lot of late nights. It took a lot of head scratching. There was a little bit of drama. But in the end, the legislature passed the bill. The governor signed it. Those who wanted to move the team to Seattle could not sue and stop the arena from being built. And the Kings, together with the city, built the Golden One Center in record time. And I think that story is important because it demonstrates, it demonstrates that if we're smart and if we are creative, that we can in fact have it all. We can have a cosmopolitan city, we can have a modern economy, we can have a green economy, and we can have a beautiful place like this that's gonna be the home to a future NBA champion. Thank you very much for having me, and congratulations. Thank you, man. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As with any good effort, not only do you need the genius of people to make things happen, the commitment of politicians to set the table in order to assure that those things happen within the community, you need to start with someone in power with a vision. 
a vision for what's possible, a vision that's grander than what anything else is out there in terms of environmental sustainability, in terms of technology, and other things. Fortunately for Sacramento, you had that triumvirate. You had Chris Granger, you had Mir Steinberg, and now we will hear from the visionary behind the Sacramento King's Golden One Center. I'm pleased to introduce Vivek Ranadive. Uh, thank you. Uh, just wanted to start by welcoming all of you to uh, Sacramento, to Golden One Center. Uh, also wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues. I've always been lucky throughout my career. Uh, I've been able to surround myself with uh, people that are way smarter than me. And uh, I had that uh, good fortune at the Sacramento Kings as well. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Martina, Joel, and, and the rest of the crew. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. How does a boy from Bombay uh, who grew up playing cricket end up buying a basketball team and building an arena? Uh, and then share with you a little bit about the vision behind the arena and also uh, how I see the future. Uh, so everybody's been uh, talking about their defining moments. Uh, so mine happened uh, when I was a, a little boy growing up in, uh, in Bombay. Uh, it was the middle of the night. And I had my ear plastered to a little transistor radio. And I heard these magical words, one small step for man, uh, one giant leap for mankind. I was listening to the Voice of America broadcast uh, the moon landing live as it happened. Uh, and there I was in Bombay, just a little boy. And I, I just was uh, speechless. I couldn't believe it. And I thought to myself, wow, who are these people who were able to take a man, put him in a box, and send him 250,000 miles away to land on a rock flawlessly? What brilliance, what courage, what perseverance. And I decided there and then that I wanted to be one of them. So I dedicated uh, my life to studying science and technology and I said to myself that somehow I was going to make my way to America. Uh, I wanted to be one of you. Uh, so I studied hard and applied to MIT. Uh, they must have made a mistake in the admission process because they uh, admitted me. Uh, and so it was that I showed up uh, on the shores of Boston with literally $50 in my pocket and, and big dreams in my head. Uh, so I was able to get a really good education. I went to MIT and I went to Harvard. Uh, ended up starting some companies. Uh, and about uh, 12 years ago, my daughter is now 24, uh, and she was a 12-year-old. Uh, and I was a single dad, and I was trying to find ways uh, to spend more time with her. Uh, so I foolishly volunteered uh, to coach her basketball team. <laughs> now, understand that I'd never actually touched a basketball in my life. I grew up playing cricket. Uh, so. Uh, I knew absolutely nothing about the game. Uh, and of course, a lot of people would say that I still don't. But uh, uh, I showed up at this uh, court in Redwood City near where I live. And I looked around the room. And uh, they had this thing called a draft, which I didn't know about. And so all the good girls were on all the other teams. And they had given me the girls that nobody wanted. Uh, and I looked around, and there were all these guys that kind of looked like you, Bill. They were like seven feet tall, ex-Division I players, uh, Stanford, Duke dads. And they were coaching all the other teams. And there was this Indian nerd coaching my daughter's team. <laughs> so the first day, I, I, I just stood there, and I was absolutely terrified. I thought, wow, you know, this is, I thought this would make me closer to my daughter. And I'm about to make a complete fool of myself. And this is going to backfire on me. Uh, so I literally didn't even know what a layup was at the time. So the first practice, I said to the girls, I said, girls, today uh, we're going to run. And I made them run up and down the court for an hour. And so then you know, the hour was over, practice was done. And I'm kind of a math nerd. So I went back 
and I studied the game, and I came up with a math equation for the game. And the second practice, I taught them the math equation. And they, they bought into it, and pretty soon uh, we started the season, and we ended up winning all our games uh, and taking uh, the team to the national championship. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, this cricket fan switched and became a huge basketball fan, and I just fell in love with this game. So then a few years later, when my neighbor, Joe Lakerb, our kids had gone to school together, called me up and said, hey, will you uh, help me buy the Warriors? Uh, I said, sure. And uh, we started this process where we, uh, he was the chairman, I was the vice chairman, uh, and we bought the Warriors. Uh, and we got booed every year for a few years. And just as the team got better, uh, I was approached about the Kings because uh, now, all of you know the well-publicized story about uh, my friend now, Steve, who was going to buy the team and move them to Seattle. Uh, so initially, my reaction was, you know, I'm a Silicon Valley person. I, I live uh, over there. We've just finished turning the Warriors around. It's starting to get fun. And why, why would I do this? Uh, and then I saw the passion of the fans, and I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, and uh, I had come to California with literally nothing in my pocket, uh, and everything I have, uh, I owe to the state of California. So at some point, something in me clicked, and I thought, you know, maybe this is something that I'm meant to do. Uh, Sacramento is our state capital. We're the sixth largest economy in the world. And uh, without the team, uh, really, th there'd be nothing in the city, and the city would be decimated. Uh, so I agreed to, uh, to jump in, and. Uh, thanks to a lot of great people, was successful in, uh, in winning the bid, buying the team. Uh, and part of what I had to commit to was I had to give a personal guarantee that I would build an arena. And the mayor mentioned this, that uh, the guarantee was that we had to have it complete by 2017. And if we didn't, then they could actually take the team back from us. Uh, now, of course, you know, we finished one year ahead of that uh, milestone, uh, and uh, here we are today. Uh, so when I, uh, about the time that I uh, started this project, uh, my, the same, uh, I have one daughter, she had given me this uh, Father's Day present, and it was a poster with uh, many different pictures uh, of her and, and me together on different uh, uh, holidays and uh, different activities we did together. And at the top were some quotes that were her favorite quotes. And at the very top was a quote by Gandhi that said, be the change you want to be. Uh, and uh, she's always uh, been uh, an environmentalist, even as a little girl. Uh, we would go scuba diving to Maui. And I would spend my time just looking at all the pretty fish. And she would uh, just go to the bottom of the ocean and just pick up all the trash and all the plastic bags and things uh, that could uh, hurt the sea life. Uh, so th this was about the time that we started this effort. Uh, and so we had some goals that we laid out, and uh, I wanted to share those with you. So one goal was we wanted to make this arena iconic. Uh, this is our state capital. It's the world's sixth largest economy. And my dream was that this would be like one day a postcard of California. When you see a postcard of California, then our arena should be on it, and it should be something that was iconic. So we had teams of architects that kept submitting designs to us, and, uh, and I kept telling them, look, when I see iconic, I'll know it. Uh, but you know, I just wasn't seeing it. So finally, they said, well, how do, you, how do you define iconic? And I said, well, if you do this with your hands, you know that that's the Transamerica Pyramid, and that's iconic. And if you do this with your fingers, you know that's the Sydney Opera House, and that's iconic. So now if you cup your hands together, that's our indoor-outdoor arena. And I believe that we've delivered an iconic. Uh, another goal was that we wanted it uh, to be green, and it, not just green in the sense that you buy a house and you slap some solar panels on it, but we wanted to set a bar that had never been set before. 
we wanted to be lead platinum, and how we thought of the arena, every dimension of it, every vector had to start with, is it green? So from the location, you know, being downtown, uh, minimizing uh, what people had to do to get here, uh, how we built it, um, it's mostly built with recycled materials. Uh, how we powered it, uh, it's all renewable energy. How we fed our fans, it all had to be local food. How we uh, kept our fans comfortable, so we used a cooling system that had never been used before in this country, and that actually uh, isn't just forced air, but the air seeps out, keeps people more comfortable, and uh, is a lot more efficient. Water is a problem in our state, uh, so we had to make sure that we had half the water consumption and we recycled the water uh, that any other arena had. Uh, so from our perspective, being green wasn't just a nice to have, it was a core design principle that had to be factored into every single vector that we thought of as we built this arena. Now I'm happy to say that uh, Thanks to the hard work of the team and uh, all of our partners, uh, we were able to deliver on that, uh, and in some cases, even exceed our expectations. Now, as great as the arena is, I also have no doubt uh, that uh, future arenas, the Warriors are building a new one, will obviously set an even higher bar, uh, and we at the Kings are gonna be the loudest cheerleaders, and we're here to, uh, to help them uh, achieve that bar. Uh, so, uh, having built the arena and having done that downtown, uh, you know, we think that this is really just the beginning uh, and we want to do a lot more. Uh, I also wanted to share with you a little bit about uh, how uh, I see the future right now. Uh, and uh, with all of the challenges that we have, I also believe that there's no better time to be alive than today. So the next 15 or 20 years, the Earth is going to see unprecedented change, where we've reached that point of exponential evolution. And I like to say that we're entering a new era. I call it Civilization 3.0. Uh, modern civilization, what I refer to as 1.0, uh, really started with the agricultural revolution. Uh, people were shopkeepers and farmers and carpenters and blacksmiths. Uh, it was the age of the artisan, and uh, the raw material was land. With the Industrial Revolution, we entered what I think of as 2.0, and it was the age of the corporation. It was all about efficiency, uh, and uh, really, the raw materials of that era were energy and steel. So we're now living in a time where the world's largest bookseller has no bookstores, and the world's largest taxi company has no cars, uh, and the world's largest hotel owns no real estate. So it's really the age of information and service, uh, and the raw materials are uh, data and imagination. Uh, and this is something that I believe uh, Sacramento has, has a lot of. Uh, now, as you think about this new era, Civilization 3.0, you also have to ask yourself, oh, well, what does that mean for City 3.0? And that was something that uh, we factored into our thinking uh, as we started building this arena. Uh, so with uh, 1.0, cities uh, were really just starting to emerge. Uh, and cities are one of mankind's biggest uh, innovations. Cities are places uh, for people to, to work, and you know, pe people gathered in a town square, they worshiped at a cathedral, uh, and it was really a gathering place. Then with the Industrial Revolution, people increasingly started moving out of the cities and uh, living in the suburbs, and cities became a place uh, for people simply to, uh, to work, and they would commute into the city, they'd work, and then they'd go back to the suburbs. Now, what we see with Civilization 3.0 is young people are urbanites, and cities are gonna reemerge as places to, to work and to play uh, and to appreciate art and music and sports and culture, uh, and so uh, cities are gonna come back into their own. Uh, and in the old days, the cathedral was kind of the gathering place. Uh, and that was where you connected with family, with friends, you looked at people, people looked at you. Uh, it, it was 
really uh, the global cat the cathedral that brought people together. We don't build cathedrals anymore, so really this arena is the 21st century global cathedral. This is where people now come to, to see other people, to be seen, uh, to enjoy uh, culture, food, music, sports. Uh, so what we did here is more than just build an arena. We built what we think of as the cathedral of the future. Uh, and if you think about what was going on with City 1.0, it was all about uh, water access. Uh, and so cities were by oceans and by rivers. Then with 2.0 and the Industrial Revolution, it was about road access and uh, it was about airport access. Now with 3.0, it's increasingly about data access uh, and also opportunity access. Uh, so we think of this city as being really the city of the future. And what we have the opportunity to do with the arena and the billion dollar investment we have uh, in this downtown, we think of it as really ground zero uh, for City 3.0. Uh, and so when you think of it in those terms, then having it be green, having uh, really setting a bar uh, for, for the future uh, becomes not just a nice to have, but it becomes uh, a must have. It becomes something that's essential. Uh, I'll just end with one thought. I know a lot of people are, uh, you know, have been kind of watching the political scene and you know, the climate accord, and there's a lot that's been going on. And I just like to go back to the quote that my daughter taught me, which is, be the change you can be, because I think that it's time for all of us uh, to just, just do the right thing and uh, not wait uh, for governments uh, to, to do it. Uh, I, I see, I think that the next generation are, are smarter than us, they're more evolved than us, uh, they're more environmentally conscious than us, uh, and so, I'm very, very optimistic that uh, even though we're at a tipping point and at a critical juncture, I, I feel that things like the Green Sports Alliance uh, are going to help us do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Vivek Ranadive. Wow, it's an amazing thing when you think about all of the passion and brilliance and cooperation and collaboration that it takes to put something like this together. It's humbling. I especially could relate to the uh, transistor radio story. Is anyone else old enough to remember listening to sporting events? on their transistor radio, sneaking it underneath the pillow, especially if anyone else like me grew up on the East Coast and the Red Sox were playing on the West Coast feed and you had to go to bed and your mother was waiting for you to go to bed and you'd sneak your transistor radio underneath the pillow. Just think if uh, we had more people like Vivek who s listened to things on their transistor radio and then turned out into engineers and changed the world. Speaking of changing the world, we have some very old, some of our very own world changers within the Green Sports Alliance. There's a young man who started out as a NCAA racing or running champion, cross country, I believe, in the University of Wisconsin for two years, national champions, and spent his entire life living in the outdoors, loving it, and caring about it. Several years ago, he and Justin and Jason and a few others decided to get together and see if they could help uh, share some of their best practices because they were concerned about their arenas and their stadiums. So they got informally together, got a little bit of help from some friends and partners and started this little group called the Green Sports Alliance. And this guy kept going. Seattle Mariners went from a 12% batting average, I like to say, to an 89% or 890 batting average, excuse me, in waste diversion. 
under Scott Jenkins' leadership. And now he's poised to open what may well supersede and become the world's new, potentially greenest lead platinum second one in a, in a couple of months. So he's been there, he's walked the walk, and for those of you who know Scott, that's the essence of Scott Jenkins. He's not loud, he's not out in front, he's behind the scenes doing the work, walking the walk, taking his daily run, picking up cans that should have been recycled. And um, so we'd like to ask you to please give a warm, warm welcome of applause for our chairman, Scott Jenkins. Thank you, Joe. I think I heard Joe say that old guy, but that might have just been a misstep. And uh, as I'm running slower and slower, I do feel a little bit old. But it is great to be here in 2017. Um, you know, it's six years now. And I think we're in a lead platinum certified arena. Vivek, Chris, hats off to you guys. Let's give him another round of applause. It's, it's great leadership, and it's great that they're hosting us here in their home. Um, for the folks that have been here for, for a day and a half now, almost two days, um, we had a wonderful uh, Pac-12 event yesterday, and uh, 150 folks from around the Pac-12 conference was here, and hats off to them. They are really exhibiting great leadership. Um, Diana and some other folks that did the Kids Summit today is another first. Uh, so that, that's, that's exciting. Um, and uh, we're not going to top this beautiful arena. Uh, I've been watching it from afar. Uh, what a wonderful uh, example of what can be built. Uh, iconic, most definitely. Beautiful architecture, um, great technology, the best food, the local stuff, and great environmental attributes. And we're trying to do some of that in Atlanta, and uh, next year hopefully we'll see you all there. But we're certainly uh, thrilled to be here in Sacramento. Um, you guys are in for a treat here shortly because um, I heard Bill Walton yesterday speak at the Pac-12 thing, and it was incredible. So, uh, Abe, you've got the easiest interview job of your life here today. I think you just have to introduce him and let him go. Um, but before we go, we're going to see a little video that highlights some of the great work that the NBA is doing. It's the NBA Energy All-Star PSA. So if we have any luck, we might roll this video. That good energy strategy is really working out there. Jason, tell me about it. It has made a huge difference. For instance, I save money by unplugging electronics when they're not being used. And that goes for putting computers in sleep mode, which also helps save the environment. Nice tip, Swim. Hey, cash is the name and savings the game. Let's switch over to Felipe Lopez for comments. Switch? That's how I reduce my energy costs, by switching to cold water when I wash my jersey. Nice. Let's do Ruth it. Ruth Riley? I'm all about keeping my team healthy. So are we going to let cold drafts in our house? No, no, no. I block drafts by waterproofing windows and doors. And I'll pass on energy-wasting light bulbs and switch to more efficient ones. Oh, no, no, no. We're recruiting each one of you to join our team and start using these energy-saving plays in your own home today. Boom. Thank you. Join the Energy All-Star Team. Sweet, very sweet. Heard a great voice there in one of the voiceovers from our next speaker. Uh, both of these guys have requested very minimal introductions, so we will honor that. Um, we've got a really, really great experience for you coming up. Abe Madcour from Sports Business Journal and Sports Business Daily, and perhaps one of the leading editors in the world and a great interviewer. And Bill Walton, who you obviously all know, so we're not going to spend time other than to tell you two things. Number one, he's not here because he's a Hall of Fame basketball player. He's here because he's a Hall of Fame environmental advocate and activist. And you're going to see that passion full on here if you, if you haven't seen it in any of his broadcasts. And the other reason why it brings me great pleasure to introduce Bill Walton is because he helped bring my hometown Boston Celtics to the 1985-86 World Championship with perhaps the greatest team of all time. 
widely considered. You can dispute it if you're a Warriors fan or a Bulls fan. Without further ado, please, gentlemen, come up to the stage and please give them a, round, a large round of applause. Abe Madcor and Bill Walton. Thank you, Joe. How's everyone doing? Give it up for the big man. I tell you, I've been doing this a long time. Live and green or die. There you go. And when they said, don't take away our children's day. And when they said, come out. Solar energy is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Come out and interview Bill Wall. Please, God, don't let me die. There's so much more to do. I, said, I am the luckiest guy in the world. I'm a California native. I heard these speakers today. I heard their story, their defining moments. I've had so many of them, none more so than being on this stage with, what's your name again? What do you do? Okay. So we're opening up this conference, right? And our survival is on the line. So you start, we had the anthem, phenomenal, fantastic. And then in basketball, the greatest game in the world, unlike football, which is basically a halfway house between the army and prison, and baseball, a bunch of out of shape guys standing around scratching themselves, taking steroids and waiting for the game of life to come to them. But no, basketball, basketball, like Vivek in his business, like the mayor running this phenomenal city, the capital of the greatest place in the world, California. And we start our basketball games a game that you can make a positive contribution every moment that you're on the court with an opening tip. And the great thing about basketball, it's pretty much like drinking tequila. All you have to do is wait for that opening tip and then you're on your way. It's just like opening the sip, right? And then you go. But one of the great things about sports, business, Green Sports Alliance, all the things that are going on here today, is that the concepts that govern our belief and our value system in life all come into play. Leadership, team, discipline, focus, concentration, commitment. And let's just speak about leadership for one moment here because we've had the leaders up here. We've got Justin, the founder, from my second home up there in Portland, Oregon. We've got... Mayor Steinberg, who is the leader here, just this fantastic visionary guy who's willing and able to pull that team together. And then we got Vivek, who, with a dream and how it's all come together. And the definition of leadership is making things better. And it's very difficult today to turn on any sort of communicative message that is coming from the outside and try to believe that things are getting better because we have been immersed and submerged in this Orwellian cacistocracy that has just been taking us backwards. And my life has always been about the dream of what's out in front of me. And so just think what it was like to be on some of the greatest teams in the history of basketball. The UCLA Bruins, we started 47 years ago. The records still stand to this day. The Portland Trailblazers, the youngest team to ever win the championship. The Boston Celtics, my boyhood dream team, the Grateful Dead. And then they're on their tour right now. I'll be joining them this weekend in <laughs> Chicago. But also the Sacramento Kings, because I was the broadcaster here. And to be touched by the fans here who are so committed and so driven, so passionate, so supportive of what they know, what we know here in California, in this greatest region in the entire world, how fantastically privileged we are to be a part of this. But when you start that opening moment with your conference, with your day, with your basketball game, think of what it was like to have Maurice Lucas as your teammate. Maurice Lucas, the greatest teammate that I ever had. Bob Dylan wrote a song with God on your side. And so here it was, when you're truly great, and the elements of leadership that come into play on a constant basis here, basketball, business, government, 
Because I grew up in an environment where government was defined as, okay, we're here to serve, we're here to protect. Somehow, that has been transferred from serving and protecting to looting, pillaging, and plundering. And so, to have Maurice Lucas on your team, though, when you bring the entire squad together, when you define the terms of the conflict, when you do what others can't and won't do, when you lead the relentless offensive attack, when you hit first, when you accept that risk, failure, doubt, hesitation, uncertainty, and failure are all part of it, and then the leader's responsibility to say, no, that was Maurice Lucas. Hmm. He did it all on a constant basis. And when we talk about defining the terms of the conflict, because that is what this group needs to start doing. Instead of start reacting, instead of start waiting, hit first. And that was Maurice Lucas. Because in basketball on that opening tip, and that was my job, that was my job to get up there and be there first, get to that ball first, push it to one of my teammates, and we're on our way. And that's what I did with Maurice Lucas every time. And he would grab the ball off the opening tip and shake everybody off and then hand it off to Lionel, pass it over to Johnny, then to Bobby, back up top to Maurice, down low to me. And we finally just keep moving around. Somebody would be wide open and we get an eight to 10 foot shot. And it would go in and they're chasing us the rest of the way to find the terms of the conflict. Now, Maurice Lucas was incredibly fortunate in that he played in an era of basketball that only had two referees and had very limited use of instant replay. <laughs> and so, the bigger the game, the greater Maurice Lucas was. The top of John Wooden's pyramid of success, competitive greatness, be at your best when your best is needed. And so, in the biggest of games, Maurice would come to me beforehand, he'd say, hey, Walt, don't tip me the ball. I learned over time what happened. Because as he took his customary position at the head of the center jump circle, and he was pinched in by the opposing players, knowing the ball was going to come to Maurice, and they would do everything they could to keep it out of his hands, as the referee stepped in, looked around, make sure everything was fine, and then put the ball, and the two hands went ever higher to determine the fate of the known world one more time, as all eyes rose up with the ball. Maurice there, waiting, big smile on his face, he took a big step to his right, bam, an elbow right into the throat of the guy on his right. He planted that right leg and he'd come back and just cold cock him and he'd look at him and say, we're here to play and we hope you are too. And that's what I'm looking for from members of the Green Sports Alliance. <laughs> because if we think for a moment, if we think for a moment that we're gonna get to where we have to go, and there's no choice in this, but we're facing forces of evil out there who are concerned only with their own bank account. And imagine, imagine what kind of person you are if you will do anything, regardless of the consequences, just for money. And that's what's happening in our world. And I've got three books for you to read as your homework assignment, Marketing Lessons of the Grateful Dead, David Merriman Scott, and. Uh, in Brian Halligan, incredible book about the future based on what happened when young guys, young hippies like me growing up just said, hey man, we're gonna do what's right and we'll let it flow and we'll see what happens. And it all just came out perfect. Second book, Dark Money, Jane Mayer, which is the history and the story of the buying by the super rich of our country for their own special interests. And don't ever think for a moment that these things are not special interests. And when we start reading these think tank papers that get put out about how environmental regulations are bad for the environment, how a higher minimum wage is bad for minimum wage earners, and how clean water is not good for you, and how cancer causing chemicals in the air, that is good for you, and how smoking is fantastic, and how if we can only just burn more coal and cut more mountaintops off and dump all the trash in the rivers, then we'll all be fine because somebody somewhere might have a job. Nothing could be further from the truth. But unless we believe that, unless we believe that, unless we live that, that's what I heard from Mayor Steinberg. That's what I heard from Justin, who had the dream of being 
with the Portland Trailblazers, chasing it all down, influenced by a defining moment early on to become a trailblazer, as I was when I first started. And he was at that game on April 14th, 2002, or whatever the year it was. And I was there, and they passed all these things out. And I kept saying, who's that guy? Where did that red hair come from? And then they threw them all on the stage, right? Right there, on the court. And everybody had a good laugh. And I broadcast that game with Marv Albert that day. And later in the spring, for the playoffs back in New York, I did a game with Marv. And after the game, we all went over to his house. And Marv had his dogs chewing on that little yeah. chew toy <laughs> there for me. Thanks a lot, Marv. Yeah. Then the final book for the homework assignment today, and we'll try to get to some more books, is David Axelrod's Believer, his own personal story and the, the dream of how, as a young boy, he saw President Kennedy in New York City, and it totally changed his life. It's just a very young boy standing on the street corner with his mom, and then he chased his whole life down and ended up with Barack Obama, and how Barack Obama then, with David's help, because nobody makes it to the top alone, here was David Axelrod right there, and this whole story and these epiphonic moments, defining moments constantly happening over the course of our lives that have determined how we got here today. But what's happened is that we have been pushed aside and we have been turned back. But I'm here to try to convince you and to elicit you to, to join the team. Because think of, think of a Grateful Dead opening to a concert of Uncle John's band, which is the calling together of the tribe, which is the Green Sports Alliance. People who were going in one direction, all of a sudden saw the light, wanted to become the light, so they just quit everything to chase their dream. And that's what Vivek's been doing. That's what Mayor Steinberg's been doing. That's what Justin's been doing. That's what Joe's been doing. That's what I've been trying to do my entire life. Because there is nothing like being part of a special team. And once you're on that special team, and the message is true, and there's honor there, you've got a chance, a chance to do something. But don't ever think it's just going to fall in your lap and somebody else is going to get it done. That's why we are here today. And the people I've been able to meet, all the different companies, all the different participants here, and how special it is. And as you guys go through your life and you're, and you're facing your own challenges, please, I need to know your story. Because I have the privilege today as Abe, right? Abe has this fantastic platform to deliver the message. Me, as an employee of ESPN, as an employee of the Pac-12 Networks, I have this opportunity to be on the stage, to be on the air. People watch, people listen, people read. And so our job is to tell these stories. We need to hear your stories so that we can keep pushing it out. When Pete Seeger died a few years ago, I've lost track. We all know what happened, we just can't remember when it happened, right? I've been doing this for a, quite a long time, 64 years old. I left home when I was 17. It was March of 1970. I haven't made it back yet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, maybe this 4th of July, I'll get home for a moment or so. But when Pete died, they brought out one of his legendary quotes, and, there's, and they're endless. The great thing about the internet and what Vivek has been able to do and create this information society as we move forward through a more advanced world, culture, and life, is that if you can think it, you can do it. You can dream it, you can go find, with Vivek's help, you can find all the tools that you need. And so that sense of what Pete Seeger said, that our job, our purpose, our mission in life is to find the great stories, because they're out there, they're everywhere, you're there. And we have to find those, develop the stories, and then tell them, tell them over and over and over again. Just think of John Wooden's Four Laws of Learning. I had this incredible teacher in my life. Had a lot of fantastic teachers, had a lot of heroes, had a lot of role models. As a child, greatest parents ever, phenomenal early coach, Chick Hearn in my ear is the voice, the messenger of hope, John Wooden. And then my sports heroes, Bill Russell, Muhammad Ali. Bill Russell on stage last night with the NBA program, and just absolutely incredible. And I loved it when he told them that everybody else he was gonna beat them. He was gonna beat Shaq and Kareem, and uh, let's see, Robinson was there, and Kemby and Alonzo Mourning, right? He just looked at him, and Bill's 83 and in a wheelchair. He's looking back and said, I'm gonna take you guys out. You got nothing on me. Right. But John Wooden, 
his four laws of learning, demonstration, imitation, correction, and repetition, the repetition of those stories. Because here were these heroes of mine and role models, and who are we going to identify as our heroes and role models today? And I was thinking at the morning session in the women's sport, innovation, leadership, and environment program, the question on the board beforehand was, which female other than your wife or your family members are your heroes? And I can identify two. I thought long and hard about it all day. Billie Jean King, who's older than me, not by much, willing to step to the front, I'll take care of this. But then also today, a much younger person, Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. who would just stand right up there and say, hey, let's go. You know, this is my family. This is who we are. And we are here, and we're going to make this better. And so as we kept going and we talked about the tools, how we're going to get to where we want to go, motivation, what's going to drive us, the four critical skills that we all have to develop, balance, quickness, creative imagination, and empathy. Balance, the ability in sports to keep your head directly over the midpoint between the two feet. So when that obstacle pops up in front of you, and right now in this area, we know who the obstacles are. That's the Koch brothers, and that's the people who are funding these phony think tanks and come up with these false statements and false beliefs, and then somebody else just puts it out there and says, okay, you know, that's the way it is. You know, fuel mileage efficiency is bad for the world, right? Cigarette smoking is fine. I'm looking for the balance in the world for the people who are causing the problems in the world to be responsible for paying for them. That's what Huey Long tried to do. Mm -hmm. Huey Long was gunned down when he was 42 years old. His dying words, because he wanted to pave the streets, build the schools, provide health care, and tax the people who were destroying the earth. They gunned him down, and his dying words, as he was surrounded by his staff, were, please God don't let me die. Balance. Not just physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, psychological, every aspect. And then quickness, to be there first. Quickness is not a physical skill. It has nothing to do with your feet. It's Vivek. It's about his brain. It's about our great governor right across the street. Mm -hmm. It's about our great mayor here in Sacramento. The guys who can have that dream. It's about Abe, and he's got to decide as the editor of a sports business journal. Okay, what's going on top? What is the message going to be? And then the creative imagination. The ability to come up with what's new. And that's all of you guys coming up with the dreams and looped, renew, all these different companies who I'm just reacquainting with, getting to know here for the first time. But just that sense of the endless possibilities and dreams that Vivek was talking about, the dream that Mayor Steinberg, and that I've tried to live my entire life. And then finally, the empathy, the empathy to understand how hard it is for other people, and then how we're all in this together and nobody makes it to the top alone. Then finally, the confidence, the confidence necessary to get this job done. We have to believe. That confidence does not just come by somebody coming over here and saying, good luck to you. It comes from the lifetime of preparation, the lifetime of sacrifice and discipline, and going out there and getting the job done. We know what has to be done. Now we need the political will, the teamwork, the camaraderie, the respect for our bodies, for the planet Earth, to go out and get it done. And then ultimately, the final tools along the way, and the persistence, the discipline, the perseverance, and the diligence that when things go wrong, that we don't just quit, mm -hmm. that we don't just give up, and we say it's too hard, I'm not going to do this. When you get told no, and you come up against that big barrier, that big hurdle, I mean, we talk about obstacles. Think if you're, as a basketball player, think if your game is only based on being the biggest, tallest guy, right? Well, what are you going to do when Kareem shows up? I mean, Kareem is here. What are you going to do when Shaq shows up? Shaq is here. Hmm. What are you going to do when Yao Ming shows up? You're, Shaq, Yao Ming is here. It's not how big you are, it's how big you play. And that's why my friend Vivek, my friend Mayor Steinberg, and my hero, Justin, who started this with Scott years ago, they said, look, 
we can be better than this. We can get this done. And then my hero and friend, Abe, who is the most kind and patient person in the world. I'm Good enjoying day. this, man. Good I'm day, enjoying Abe. this, man. What was your question again, sir? I'm sorry, I forgot. How about that? Throw it down. Throw it down one time. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing cooler. I just, I just couldn't believe this article the other day, right? Breitbart News gets this guy, Tim Donnelly, <laughs> who used to be this, I don't know, they said he was a state senator. I don't know, maybe he got that down at the gas station or something, I don't know. But they got him to write this article that, oh, there's too much solar in California, we gotta turn it off because we're having to pay. I mean. What could be more ludicrous than this? And if you, if you don't know who Tim Donnelly is, just go and read, just go to Wikipedia and read who he is, and you'll find immediately that where this guy is coming from. And always, when these people make these out, incredibly outlandish statements that just they just have no basis in fact, and no, worse, no basis in common sense. Just go and find out where the money is, and who's backing these guys, and who's putting that pressure on them to say what they're saying. I'm lucky. I'm a volunteer for the Green Sports Alliance. I'm a volunteer for the game of life. I work for ESPN, this most incredible company, at the very top, Bob Iger, at the titular top, at the uh, operation level, John Skipper, these brilliant, compassionate, kind, generous, loving, warm human beings that realize that this is a planet that we've got to take over. Disney, ESPN, phenomenal. I work for Larry Scott and Jamie Zaninovich with the Pac-12 Network. Incredible visionary leaders. Go and study their bio on Wikipedia. They are not being funded by these Koch brother front companies, right? And then I also work for the NBA <laughs> and David Stern. And what this guy, and ultimately Adam Silver, who's the new young guy, right? Because we're all <laughs> old and in the way. But this phenomenal, yeah, it I mean, everybody talks about how Magic and Larry saved the NBA. David Stern found, saved the NBA. I mean, there's always been great players, and there will always be great teams. But without the guy leading the way business-wise, because without the ability to turn our dreams, our visions, our passions into a business, as Abe has been able to do with this hugely successful sports business journal something that we start our day with every day, and it just brings us all together, steers us in new directions, and that was David Stern. And we talked about the value of sports and what it means to a community. And David Stern, more than anyone in, David Stern is the most important man in the history of basketball. This tall, Why? never shot a basket. Never, but, he, but what he did in terms of using the vehicle that he had, using the platform that he had, to make a better world and, and identifying what his agenda was, being able to monetize everything. And everything you see up here is the result of six factors that all came together in the early 1980s. And it was all going just fine there. And then we had this election last November 8th. Oh my gosh, I've got to stop leaving the country during the elections. In 2000, I was in Australia for the Olympics. In 2016, I was over in China with the Pac-12 China Initiative and mm. Jack Ma and Alibaba. And man, I come back and like, oh my gosh, what <laughs> happened? And so, but David Stern, he drove the world to a better place by using basketball and the green initiative, but the business initiative and the economic initiatives, everything he did, and it was always with the vision of what can I do to make this better? And that was Bill Russell, my favorite player ever. That was Magic Johnson, that's Steve Nash, that's now Lonzo Ball. These guys who just walk out there and say, what can I do to help here? And the, you know, these great public servants that we have, these great leaders that we have, and when David Stern, took the NBA to Africa, and he went down there, and they were having all the meetings and the clinics and the programs and the lessons of life and how they're gonna help what's going on down there in South Africa. Nelson Mandela, who was just recently out of jail, he called up David and asked for a meeting. David said, well, where do I come? <laughs> I'll come right away. And Nelson said, I'll come to you. And when Nelson came in, David was just like overwhelmed and, and stunned of this incredible leader. And we've all had leaders in epiphonic moments, and this is the one that David loves to refer to all the time. And, and David asked Nelson, what should I do? Here I am in, on top of this business. And Nelson said, 
do what you're doing now. Keep moving it forward. It's a big, giant opportunity. You never know how it's going to play out. But your heart is good. Your mind is good. And that's what separates great champions and great leaders. And to hear Vivek talk about intelligence and data and all the different things that are driving the future of the world, which is what's happening right now, because it's all about the technology. The, the technology for our health, which is on the macro level, our ultimate individual, micro level, excuse me, ultimate individual level is to make sure we're healthy so that we can keep going. Secondly, on the macro level, the grand level, we have to reduce consumption through technology. And whether it's the lighting, whether it's the products that we use, whether it's the packaging, whatever it is, we have to reduce consumption. And there has to be a correlation to a chart. We have the technology to chart everything today. I mean, come on, there'll be a broadcast game and somebody will be doing something and will say, well, and somebody will hand you a note, this is the worst performance in the history of basketball we're witnessing <laughs> right now, right? But we cannot, com we cannot compute and display and put out there for the world to see every day what our cities, what our industries, what our individual people are consuming in terms of electricity so that there's a gauge, a standard that we can reduce that not so much through usage, but through the technology that is changing all of our lives. And then we have to produce new energy, and the future of that is solar and wind. We're already maxed out on hydro. There are other renewable sources of energy. It's no longer alternative energy. Solar and wind are mainstream, and that's the future. And then we have to manage the limited resources that we have. Clean air, clean water, clean energy, and we got a chance to move on beyond the opening tip of this game. Now, what was your question? I'm sorry. I'm I, Bill. That, that is uh, quite an... Uh, how about this? Best leader outside of Maurice Lucas who you've seen? Well, Larry Bird was the best player I ever played with, by far. Why? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what made Why? <laughs> Uh, what just made him so intuitive and special? My plane tomorrow morning's at 10.30. <laughs> Nobody, I never saw anyone inspire <laughs> the home crowd like Larry Bird did. And that's, you know, I've been part of great crowds. The UCLA crowd, the first great basketball fan base, been decimated right now by just the negativity and the, and the mindless, senseless choices and directions. The Portland Trailblazers, which still to this day have the record for the longest uh, consecutive sellout streak in the history of sports, 18 consecutive years you could not buy a ticket. And it was so embarrassing for me when Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir and Mickey Hart and, and Bill Kreutzmann and, and Phil Lesh and whoever was playing the piano at the time, they'd be in town for a concert and they'd say, Bill, we'd love to come to the game. And I'd call up the Blazers and they said, you know, we don't have any tickets. Oh my God. <laughs> and, oh, and, God. and they'd say, I, I said, come on, it's the Grateful Dead, man. They got to come to the game. They said, well, we can squeeze them in in the standing room only slots oh, at the Lord. midway mezzanine level, right? And to see Jerry up there with his, you know, black leather jacket and his black sunglasses, you couldn't tell whether he was even awake or not. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, they came, and, and then the Boston Celtics and the Grateful Dead fans, the King fans, but those, those Celtic fans, if any of you had the privilege and honor of seeing the new ESPN 30 for 30 mm -hmm. and just the, the, the passion and the commitment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, but once separ so many things separated Larry. He was the smartest guy. He loves to pr portray himself as the hick, hick from French Lake. Nothing could be further from the truth. But his heart and... He never, he was like Kareem, and he was like Michael. He never got tired of throwing 50 in your face. He, he just loved to beat you every time, and, and, and then loved to talk trash. He, you know, Larry and John Wooden were the greatest trash talkers in the history of, of the sport of basketball. John it was Wooden. Incredible. Was oh, John, John Wooden, yeah. And then uh, other great leaders, you know, I, I, on the, so I never got to, the, as a child, my heroes and leaders were Russell Ali, in politics, in, on, on the social front, it was Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Sergeant Shriver. Right. And then in the musical and entertainment world, it was the Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan and Neil Young and John Fogarty and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Carlos Santana and Bruce Springsteen and the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac and the Rolling Stones and John Lennon. And they're all going. And they're all still out there right now. Was Jerry a good leader? Jerry was a fantastic leader. He was Jerry and Larry and... 
John Wooden are all the same person. How so? They didn't care about themselves. One of the things about the people I admire and respect the most is they're not into stuff. They're not into material accumulation and physical gratification. They are into making the world better and, and, and making the team better. And they had, Jerry, Larry, and Wooden, they had the same approach, that it was a privilege, a privilege to be a part of something so special, like the GSA, and like the Blazers, like the Celtics, like the Dead. And so I had these endless arguments with John Wooden on every single subject. Why you play for him, right? Or, no, or I mean, so I, Coach Wooden, I would always, you know, I always wanted to, I was Coach Wooden's easiest recruit. I was his worst nightmare, and I drove the poor guy to an early grave at 99. Because I always wanted to know why. Why I had to cut my hair, why I had to shave, why I had to wear the clothes he wanted me to wear, why Nixon was president, why we were in Vietnam, and why the cheerleaders couldn't be in my hotel room on the road trip. And this was his look. If the slideshow is working up there, I don't know if it is or not, but there, there, there may be a picture that pops up. Because that's the way it works when you're in the world of the Grateful Dead. Kerry, is the slideshow working up there? Okay. So this was his look. He would cross his arms, hold one elbow in his palm. And then he was, he was an English teacher by profession who used to have young men under his athletic supervision in the afternoon. I'm not even sure he liked basketball. He, he never, baseball was his favorite sport. We could never figure that out. And... And I'm a speed freak, right? I like bicycle racing and pianos and drums and basketball and let's go, right? And so he would sit there and listen to my complaints, my whining, my excuses. He wouldn't say a word, but he would rest his chin on his thumb and put his finger across his lips. Finally, through all my stuttering and spitting and not being able to communicate at all, he waved me off, rolled his eyes and says, you know, Bill, it's all fine and good that you think that way and believe that stuff, but I'm the coach here. And while we've enjoyed having you, we're gonna miss you. And as soon as he said that, I knew I had lost. In 43 years with the guy, I never won a single argument with him. And towards the end of his life, we did a big, huge event. Packed house, 25,000 fans, right? And listening through media all over the front of the room. And some very young reporter who was not there at the time raised his hand sheepishly and said, Coach Wooden, Coach Wooden, were you really going to kick Bill Walton off the team because he wasn't going to shave or cut his hair? And Coach sat up extra straight and he looked at me and looked back at the guy and looked at the crowd and just incredulous. And he looked at them and he said, the only thing that matters is that Bill thought I was going to kick him off the team. All right, all right. And I did. And there was nothing more important than being on the team. Because when you're on a special team, when you're part of something that's magnificent, Sacramento has had it, they're trying to get back. This building will help incredibly. The Celtics are getting close. But you don't win. You don't get to the top unless you have great leadership, great management, and the top players. Right now, there's just a few top players in the NBA. And that's the way it's always been. Those players today are Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Steph Curry, and... It's a big drop off from there. Big drop off. What was your question again, Abe? I'm sorry. What, what about? Oh, so Jerry. Jerry with his leadership, right? Right. So, in a band, you know, they're always fighting. They're always fighting about everything, and and so Jerry, he wouldn't say much. And finally, when they're fighting, he would just, you know, lean forward and say, "Hey, look, if you don't like it here, I know another guy over there who might want to take your job." And the guy would immediately clam up and say, okay, that's fine, let's go. I, I really do like it here. And then, so staying on a privilege. And, yeah, it was st like, st staying it was, on the whole concept that it's a privilege. Yeah. And, and this is a privilege to be a part of something like this, a privilege to be a part of this conference, because this is the future. And you know, my future, that's about science, technology. I want to live forever, right? Science, technology, education, and, and, and the vision, solar energy. I mean, the biggest no-brainer in the history of the world. The, st the statistics are staggering. And just, I fly every day. And it just, it saddens me so much. Every, every airport I come into, I just look around, and there's all these roofs, and there's no solar panels mm -hmm. on it. I don't get it. I mean, solar energy is, is 
everything that I believe in, science, technology, democracy, independence, empowerment, and the use of the natural world around us to improve our lives. And it just keeps running every single day. It's just absolutely awesome. I, and I just don't understand it. Because your house in San Diego is all, all solar. Our, our right. house in San Diego is covered with solar panels. Right. And we have rainwater capture systems off. Uh, we, every drop of water that comes off our roof is reused into the irrigation uh, through these very uh, efficient and, and, and low emission water systems. Every light bulb in our house is, a, is an LED uh, light. And so, it, 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 and when you put it all together, I mean, we have zero electricity bill in our house. And we have a very large house with lots of stuff going on, but zero electricity bill. And our water bill has just dropped dramatically. And you know, we, we live in a desert and you know, water, the, and that water's gotta be clean. I mean, you, you look around and you know, the, when I grew up, when I grew up in San Diego, if anybody's ever been there, you drive right through town in the bay, San Diego Bay, Mission Bay, these just absolutely spectacularly beautiful places. When I was growing up in the 50s, people just used those bays as the town dump. Now, they're absolute pristine jewels, magical places. When I was growing up, we'd go outside and we lived outside. It was perfect. If it ever went below 70 degrees, we just, what happened to the world, right? And then we'd just go inside and take a nap and we'd wake up and it'd be nice again. And so, but in the course of my young life, there I was and all of a sudden, as the population surge kept coming and coming, and they built the freeways, and the more cars came all the time. And then the story chronicled in David Halberstam's The Powers That Be about how the political and economic interests in Southern California changed the model of what has happened in the Eastern cities, because we had a real chance in California where they just eliminated any sense of public transportation in Southern California. And so they just kept spreading out and spreading out and spreading out with ever bigger freeways, ever more freeways and longer commutes and more cars. And so then in the mid 60s, the air turned brown and you couldn't see anymore. And you couldn't breathe anymore. And they would announce on that radio every day, don't let the children and the old people go outside today. And then People like Levesque, Levesque, excuse me, they stepped to the front, as Maurice Lucas would always do, and say, I'll take care of this. And they went into the science institutions of our great Pac-12 Conference of Champions, and they came up with all the different ideas, catalytic converters, and then they made the regulations, and you know, you got to have fuel mileage efficiency in all your cars. And then that was going along and everything fine. And then the Japanese, who, like the Germans, are so far ahead of us in everything that we're trying to do here. And we, we need to learn from others. Because whenever you listen to a great speaker who's been around the world and somebody who's old and done a lot of different stuff and, and read all these books like Shoe Dog from Phil Knight, the most important man in the history of sports. Read Shep Gordon's Supermensch, the same story as, Super, uh, as Shoe Dog, but something that is based on Hollywood, entertainment, rock and roll, and the music industry, right? And so these guys who started with nothing, like Vivek just living there, getting here with $50 in his pocket, the, the, those stories are endless. Our job is to find it and tell it. But too many of our young people think it's just easy. and Somebody else is going to take care of it. And that's not what happened. It's what's going to happen. Never let somebody else do what you're supposed to do. And always understand as an ultimate leader that the worst things you could do for the ones you love are the things they could and should do for themselves. And that's why when we started talking about these great players, Bill Russell, Magic, Steve Nash, Lonzo Ball, who played strictly, who played strictly for others, none of those guys were the winners of the genetic lottery. None of them were the fastest, the strongest, the biggest, the toughest, the highest jumpers, but they had a mind and they had a heart. And they were willing to do whatever it takes. And so that's where John Wooden's most, his fallback mantra, and he had a billion mantras, one for every situation on earth. He just kept rattling them out and pushing them out. We just have to finally tell him, shut up, coach, leave us alone, let us play ball, right? He'd come right back with another one. Never mistake activity for achievement. 
When everybody thinks alike, nobody thinks. It's okay to disagree, just don't be disagreeable. But the one he kept falling back on on a constant basis was basketball. It's just like life. It's not a game of size and strength. It's a game of skill, timing, and position. And so what we find this big utility mess that we're in right now, because as people are coming more and more to solar and eventually we'll all get batteries, batteries, the utilities are fighting us. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're reducing our consumption, we're creating our own power, and now the utilities, like the politicians who were supposed to be on our side, supposed to represent us, they're saying, no, you can't do that anymore. We're gonna shift it so you have to pay more money at night when we're already generating more power than we're using over the course of the day. No, you can't get off the grid. No, you can't have your own battery. So all this no, no, no negativity, here it was, Coach Wooden. Basketball, not a game of size and strength. Skill, timing, and position. It's not how big you are. It's how big you play. It's not how high you jump. It's where you are and when you jump. And so I'm scratching my head. And I'm saying, wait a second, Coach. This makes no sense at all. You're telling me that basketball is not a game of size and strength? Kareem has all the records, Shaq has all the money, and Wilt has 20,000 girlfriends. So you tell me how it's not a game of size and strength. And Coach Wooden, he would look at me and say, well, you're the slowest learner I've ever had. Don't you realize it's not about stuff? It's about training your mind, and it's about making the necessary sacrifices and discipline in a team concept to make sure that the greater good is achieved. Because that's what he was all about. Now, when you're the great player like Larry, when you're the great player like Jerry, John Wooden was the first great player, but his life changed, as all of our lives have changed. And as we think of Neil Young's brilliant album, Fork in the Road, you know, what do we do? An incredible book about the fork in the road is My Personal Best by John Wooden. Now, John Wooden wrote a ton of books. They're all the same, he just changed the cover. And, and, and had somebody else write the forward to it. And so, but my personal best is a compilation of many of the epiphonic moments of where Coach Wooden was going along in one direction and everything was fine, whether it was as a great player, whether it was at a, as a, 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 a man in the Navy during World War II, whether it was as a young father, a young coach, and on through this incredible life and, and brilliant career doing so many different things. But, as these moments came upon him, when bam, it was right there and something had to happen, the same way it was for Mayor Steinberg and Vivek when they had to try to save this team. And this book, My Personal Best, is full of those type of lessons. And it's just, it, you know, unless we read, dinosaurs didn't read. They're extinct today. Let's not fall down that right. same trap door. Read the Sports Business Journal every day, as I do along with solarwakeup.com. Do you, do you think you'll see athletes as uh, advocates? Uh, uh, they have to be, are, because it's the greatest platform ever. And Are they reluctant? Foolishly, foolishly, because ultimately that the sense of authenticity is what everybody is looking for as a consumer, and how we're going to grow this Green Sports Alliance to make it to the point of this building is packed. And that's what I want to see next year down in Atlanta at the Mercedes building with Scott, in that everybody is there. And we're going to make this happen, but think of the NBA and, and, and how it grew. Think of what John Wooden was able to do in building UCLA. Think what Larry Scott is building with the Pac-12 uh, conference and, and network, think what Skipper and Bob Iger are building with, with ESPN, is that you have to create something of value that people who are going to be your consumers are going to be able to relate to. So that when they're in the stands, when they're reading your publication, whether it's online, whether it's a hard copy, whatever it is, however they're consuming what you have, they've got to feel that that's something that relates to them. And that was my dream. Vivek talked about his dream when he got off in Boston and the shores of MIT and how that completely changed his life. Listen to Jack Ma's story from Alibaba and listen to 
all these different people who have, have you know, Reed Shoe Dog and Shep Gordon, Super Mensch, and how it changed their lives when they were touched by something that was absolutely special and fantastic. And in the world of the NBA, they're sitting right here in that seat, and that action is going up and down, and it is fierce as can be, and everybody's on the edge of their seat, and the ball is in the air, and, and Marv Albert is trying to throw the, the Bill Walton little puppet to his dog, and it's just one of those moments when you're, oh my God, what is happening here? And then as the buzzer goes off, and who knows how it plays out, but everybody walks out, and on their way out, they said, man, I got to buy a shirt from this moment. I got to buy a hat from this moment. I got to stop and get the restaurant and just calm down a little bit. But most importantly, it's what I say every day when I leave the latest Grateful Dead concert. I'm with those guys. Where's the next show? Because if you're interested in what's next, we learn from the past. We live in the moment, but we dream about that future. And, and, and that dream, the dream of 100% renewable energy, 100% recycling, the dream where we can all just come to the game and have a good time and talk about what Abe's editorial was about today and how cool that was. And I also encourage you to read Sinclair Lewis's 1935 book, It Can't Happen Here, because it is happening here. 77 years ago, he wrote it in response to the rise of fascism in Europe and what's happening in terms of the bullying of the press, the discrediting of our public institutions, the lying, the deceit, the, the falsities that are being spread all the time, and the fact that people are just standing up there with a position and a role of serving and protecting or just saying, I don't care. I don't care what happens to anything or anybody because I got mine. And that is the antithesis of the world that I want to live in. I want to live in a world that I grew up in where as soon as anybody got a step out in front, they turned right around, put that hand down, and out and said, come on, you're coming with me. You're with us. Let's get going. Now, what was that question? I'm sorry. What's next for you? Oh, I'm just getting started. I've, <laughs> I've never, been, never been busier, never been happier, haven't been this healthy since I was That's great. 13 years old. And I was born with birth defects in my feet. And we had no money, never went to the doctor, even when, you know, bones are sticking out. My mom would just say, rub some dirt on it, you'll be fine. Put some ice on it. And, but I had these uh, terrible birth defects in my feet, which I ground to dust. Both my ankles are fused from the knee down on both sides, it's just all one bone. When I was 14, I was down at the gym, and I was playing against some really old guys. They were in their 30s, and I was torching them. I was having a big day, and they didn't like it. So they took me down with a high-low one-two. Tore up my knee, I had to have the first of ultimately 37 orthopedic operations on this body that is not built to last. Huh. And I just have never been able to keep it going. And then when I was 21, I was playing for UCLA. We hadn't lost a game in five years. And I'm high above the basket making a play on the ball. The guy from the other team in a despicable act of violence and dirty play came from the other side of the court, took my legs out from underneath me, flipped me over, bam, landed flat on my back on the... Innovation of the day, which was a tartan floor, which is harder than this cement right down here, basically only good for landing airplanes on, broke two bones in my spine that day, and I spent the rest of my life chasing the dream, the dream of being part of something special. But I spent half my adult life in the hospital, and I spent most of my adult life, most of my adult life thinking that I would never be pain-free, relatively, or happy in love. I'm completely pain-free right now. I take no medication. I have no pain whatsoever. I go all the time. And I'm blissfully happy and loved and married for 27 years to this angel of mercy. I cannot... I cannot speak for her, but... <laughs> I'm a happy, lucky dude. And I don't know what's next for me. And the Grateful Dead wrote a song. It was a combination song, and I hope they play it this weekend in Chicago. But uh, Lost Sailors, a, a lot of the songs are about me. And, and, and the cool things about all the guys who I love is, you know, they, they wrote all the songs to me, for me, and about me. Right? And, uh, but, but this one is, the opening part is Lost Sailor. I'm a lost sailor, a way too long at sea. It goes through the whole song, and it transitions. And the beautiful thing about basketball, about life, 
is that all the words are the same in terms of how we're going to overcome hurdles, difficulties, obstacles, and challenges. Transition, rebound, crossover, change of pace, change of direction, momentum, timeout, rhythm. So as that transition from Los Sailor goes into saying the circumstance, I sure don't know what I'm going for, but I'm going to go for it for sure. Used to be that lost sailor, now I'm a tiger in a trance, a saint of circumstance. And that sense, because who would have ever thought that little Billy, with his red hair, freckles, big nose, goofy, nerdy looking face, and horrendous speech impediment, would ever be the broadcaster, would ever be the speaker on this stage. Basketball, easiest part of my life ever. Academics, equally as easy. Straight A student all the way through. My life has been defined, though, by these meteoric climbs to the top and then catastrophic health crises with this body that just wouldn't carry me. I could never keep it going. I could never defend being on the top. But as big a challenge as that was, my greatest accomplishment in life is learning how to speak. I could not say a word. I could not say hello. I could not say thank you until I was 28 years old. And then an incredibly kind, saying the circumstance, Marty Glickman, in five minutes, laid out how I could learn how to speak, telling me that I think you have a chance. And learning how to speak is my greatest accomplishment in life and your worst nightmare. <laughs> and when, <laughs> when Marty sadly died, and please read Marty's book, Fastest Kid on the Block, and then see the HBO movie, brilliant, Glickman. Marty, whose story is phenomenal, we won't tell it here because you should find it out yourself. Don't let other people get your kicks for you. But here it was when Marty died. And Marty was universally acknowledged as one of the top five broadcasters of all time. And so they came to Coach Wooden. Coach Wooden, who is the master of the eulogy, the master of the obituary, right? Because he knows everybody and he's just perfect with the English language. And so he starts talking about how, Mar how much Marty did for all of us. The same way that here in Sacramento it's Grant Napier, the same way it was for me it's Chick Hearn, uh, the same way, you know, all these people who just have this incredible impact and power and the ability to deliver that message, right? That message of hope, because we're hearing far too much about the message of fear, the message of death, if you don't buy this, you're going to die. And if you don't buy this worse yet, you're not going to be cool, right? Well, that's not my message. My message is to get on tour with the Grateful Dead and find the dream, shine the light, be the light. And so Coach Wooden is rhapsodizing about Marty's contributions to the world. And he's on and on and on. The guy's writing it all down. I'm sitting right there. And then Coach comes to a, a dead stop, and that was so un unlike him, because he always was just so perfectly planned. And then he looked at me and looked back at the writer, and he goes, but you know what? Even though Marty's dead now and never want to say bad things about the dead, I'm mad at Marty. Writer, oh, headline, you know. Coach looked at him and said, Marty taught Bill Walton how to speak, but he didn't teach him how to stop. And so that sense <laughs> of what's for me, my, I grew up in a non-business environment, and it was just not my interest. I, you know, I wanted to be the best basketball player. I wanted to be part of a great team. I wanted to be on tour with the Grateful Dead and Bob and Neil and all these, different Fogarty and everybody else. I wanted to go to the big festivals, which I still do, Desert Trip, fantastic. Sad that they're not going to do it again this year. I wanted to ride my bike. I wanted to go to the beach. I wanted to enjoy the beauty of the Golden State. I'm a warrior of the Golden State. But my life changed completely in February of 2008, when all the years of the bad feet, the crooked leg, the broken spine, 200 plus nights a year on the road, 600,000 air miles domestic alone every single year in airplanes you can't stand up in, hotel rooms you can't fit in, beds, bathrooms, furniture, all built for preschool children. Right? <laughs> and so my body just failed and collapsed, and then everything changed. And ever since then, it took me about four and a half years to get back up and get going again. 
But my life was saved. My life was saved by technology. My life was saved by visionaries. My life was saved by advancements in, uh, in medicine through entrepreneurs and through medical devices and techniques and procedures and everything. And it's just, and it's mind boggling to me that as we have, because you know, right now we're having this gigantic battle over healthcare. And I'm for single payer healthcare. And the whole sense of that we are, so many people in our population are just living in abject fear that they're gonna get sick. And if you don't think that stress and fear have an impact on your everyday health, you're not living <laughs> with fear and stress. And so, and then, but what's gonna happen next is that they're gonna get into the tax code. And which gets into the subsidy issue of why are we subsidizing things that are bad? Why aren't things like fossil fuels, guns, tobacco, cigarettes, alcohol, junk food, sugar drinks, why aren't they taxed? Why are we putting the taxes on things that are good, like medical devices, like research, like education? Why aren't we supporting things that are good? Two fantastically great books that I just read, The Geography of Genius, The Geography of Bliss. I don't know how to pronounce the guy's last name. He's, he spells it Weiner, but he says it's Weiner. It doesn't look like Weiner. Weiner is spelled to me, W-H-I-N-E-R. Right? Eric will give him the benefit, Weiner. Right? But one of the notions of this book, what we value will flourish. If we value all the negative things in life, and what leads to problems? Lack of honor, selfishness, greed that leads to anger, hatred, and ultimately violence. It can't happen here, Sinclair Lewis, read the book. It is alternately brilliant in its satire and, and use of the English language and then abject terror of what's on its way next and what's gonna happen to us if we don't wake up and get out there and vote. And when I see that 90 million Americans did not vote in the last election, what is happening here? I mean, Steinberg, these guys who just give up their lives to get involved with everything, and there's so many good people, so many great things going on, but we allow ourselves. And when I, and when I think about what has happened, if there are two Carolinas, two Dakotas, and two Virginias, why aren't there 50 Californias in terms of the re representation back in Washington, D.C.? And so, I mean... We, here in the Conference of Champions, we have 75 to 80 million people, a quarter of the population of the world, of, of our country right here, and the best place in the world. And on, this is where everybody wants to come. 50% of the people in the world live within 50 miles of the beach. And the other 50% are trying to get there. And so where I'm going next, I'm going energy production, solar, and because where I live, the sun shines every day. And, and there's no wind. And so, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm like Vivek. I want things to be local. And the business, San Diego has this incredible collaborative business environment, which has an innovation economy, fourth largest economy on the West Coast, and it focuses on these clusters and silos. The life sciences, wireless technology, clean tech, a $7 billion a year business in San Diego. Biotech, a hugely productive and important cluster in San Diego. And then the sports business. Because everybody moves to San Diego between Dana Point and Ensenada, 30 miles south of the Mexican border, there are 10 million people that live right there, right along the coast. And everybody comes there because it's just so fantastic. And there's not a day in your life that you just can't go out and do whatever you want to do. It's just absolutely the greatest place on earth, and everybody comes there for that life, but then they realize they have to get a job, and so they all start companies. And so I'm a volunteer in all these nonprofit business accelerating trade organizations, much the way I'm a volunteer for the Green Sports Alliance, which started in the place where I got my professional start, and how, how it all comes full circle. And now my uh, renewed relationship with Justin and Scott and the fantastic work that they're doing. This will be a, a huge part of my life moving forward. And all the different things, I mean, I, if you're really interested, you can go to my website, which is billwalton.com. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And I do a, 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 do a lot of work 
uh, with uh, an organization that's dear to my heart, uh, the Challenged Athletes Foundation. I'm a volunteer. I don't have my own uh, foundation or anything like that. I'm not into that. And, you know, I thought Warren Buffett said it perfectly. We got enough foundations. We need more people to work and give money to the foundations that we already have. And so, but this foundation, we buy, we raise money and we buy wheelchairs and prosthetics for people that don't have arms and legs. And so many of the lessons in life that have driven me to where I am today, I mean, health. There's all these people, veterans coming back from the Middle East, Iraq and Afghanistan, blown up, no arms, no legs, brain damage, PTSD, and they think their lives are over, as I did eight and nine years ago when my spine failed. I know otherwise now, and my whole life has changed, my whole concept of what it takes with everything here. So here's this Challenge Athletes Foundation. We help the, the children with the birth defects that never had the chance, the chance to make it happen in their own life that we just all take for granted. The chance that I grew up with, thinking, yeah, everybody lives in San Diego. This is the greatest place ever, right? And everybody has a wonderful family and schools and opportunities and coaches and teachers. And then the third group is the people who get sick, the people who get in an accident, they lose a leg, they lose an arm, they get paralyzed, get brain damage, whatever it is, they get cancer, and it just, they think it's over. So we provide programs leadership, friendship, mentorship, and equipment so that people can get going once again. The same way that those solar panels, the same way that those windmills, the same way that all your companies, which are getting all these great products out there and all these great dreams as to make it all happen, they provide that opportunity, that springboard for us to get going. So one of the things that we do, we go out and we ride our bikes. We ride our bikes to raise the money. And every year we ride from San Francisco to San Diego. And we raised a couple million dollars for this to buy these very expensive pieces of equipment for people who don't have the chance, wouldn't have the chance without this stuff. And so the first year I did it, I didn't think I was going to make it because I had just spent the previous four years on the ground being unable to move. And now here I am riding my bike from San Francisco to San Diego. And the sense of empowerment, the sense of self-esteem that sports gives you, the sense of being part of a real squad and a group of people who all have a mission and a purpose in life. And we're coming down the coast, and now on the last day, I'm feeling it, and I'm starting to get stronger as we go along. And that's just the greatest feeling in the world when you're getting near your destination and you know you're gonna make it. And so I pulled back from the group as we're coming through Del Mar. And believe me, if the pilgrims had landed in Del Mar, Everything over there would be one big wilderness area and big national park. Mm. And so, and I'm thinking to myself, it wasn't that long ago where I was going to kill myself. Mm. I was going to kill myself because my life was not worth living, because I had so much pain, unrelenting, debilitating, excruciating. I would lie there on the floor. If I had a gun, I would have used it. There was no hope. There was no dream. There was no belief that I would ever get better and it would ever stop just hurting because the pain, I could only describe it as being submerged into a vat of scalding acid that had an electrifying current running through it, and it would never shut off. And I just wanted it to all be over. But now here I was riding my bike on this most beautiful sunny day, and I'm on the coast of California, not knocking on the golden door, meet me on the burning shore, and I'm just gliding along, and it's perfect. And I'm thinking about all the people that would call me all, every day when I was down and in this incredibly dark depression, and they'd say, don't give up, Bill, you can make it. But I had given up. It was just too hard. And so as I come down south out of Del Mar and I'm coming down into the estuary, and there it is, La Jolla, Black's Beach, the lagoon, the cove, the point, Mount Soledad, all out in front, Torrey Pines, this course. I'm having the time of my life. It's better than perfect. I can't believe how lucky I am. And as that, then I start the climb. And in the world of cycling, you love the climbs. That's what it's all about. You know, finding the rhythm, and the pace, and the beat as you're going up, because you learn over the course of your life that it takes all you've got just to stay on that beat. And if you're going to try to spread the, the flame from the stage to the floor, you better stay on that beat. So I had the beat going, and I'm coming up, and I'm all by myself. Everybody else had gone ahead of me, and that was fine, because I love riding by myself. I've got Phil Liggett in my ear. He's telling me how great I'm doing. And when I'm riding by myself, I can convince everybody and myself, and most importantly, that I'm going fast. And so I'm on this climb, and I come around the halfway turn. And as I look up, <clears throat> I look up, there's one of my teammates, and she's all by herself. Her name is Kelly. And Kelly is just 
absolutely an exquisite human being and a great athlete. Looks a lot like this Kelly over here. Absolutely spectacular, stunning, raven-esque, statuesque, a goddess of the night, right? But Kelly, this Kelly, she's paralyzed. She's paralyzed from her rib cage down. And she has just ridden her bike, hand cycle, all by herself from San Francisco to San Diego. And she's on the last climb. And I look up, and she's struggling. She is all alone, has no chance. She doesn't have a rhythm. I'm coming up behind her. I'm telling her, come on, Kelly, don't give up. You can make it. Don't give up, Kelly. I start singing the songs. Jerry Garcia, <clears throat> Mission in the Rain. Some folks would be so happy. They have just one dream come true. Mm -hmm. Bob Dylan, Chimes of Freedom, Far Between. Sundown's finish and midnight's broken toll. We ducked inside the doorway, thunder crashing. Tolling for the warrior, tolling for the luckless, tolling for the abandoned, the outcasts, and for state. Striking for the gentle, striking for the kind, striking for the guardians and protectors of the mind. For every uptight, hung up person in this whole wide universe, we gaze upon those chimes of freedom flashing. And as I come up, I'm crying and I'm yelling, don't give up, Kelly, you can make it. I'm looking at her, she just can't get the cranks over. She's so tired, she's so beat up, she's so worn out. I'm looking down at her cluster, at her cassette. She's got no gears left. She has no equipment that's gonna get her over that top. So I'm saying, Kelly, come on, don't give up. You can make it, find that rhythm, take a breath, keep your breathing going. And she finally just gets it over once. Then on the downstroke, I'm thinking, if she doesn't get this next stroke over the top, she's going to roll backwards down this long hill all the way back into the ocean. And she takes another big deep breath, and she's over. And once you get that second crank, then she found it. And we both just glided up to the top, soared across at the top of the Torrey Mesa like eagles. And then we came around the turn through UCSD, a school that is 85% self-powered with fuel cells, with cogen plants, and massive solar installations all over everything, right through the campus, all this innovation, all this science and technology, down where Vivek got his start with Linkabit and Erwin Jacobs, this incredible genius and entrepreneur who has helped fund and found the Challenge Athletes Foundation, how it all rolls into one. And as we soar down the hill, right through the campus and down, there's La Jolla and the beach is just perfect and palm trees and grass. And we get there, we roll up to the finish line and there's hundreds hundreds and hundreds of families there and all the little children running around and playing with all the soccer balls and volleyballs and frisbees and they're all riding their bikes and you look at every one of them and every one of them's in a, a sport chair everyone's got a prosthetic everyone's got some sort of cancer some sort of deformity some sort of paralysis some sort of amputation and it, it's just it's just overwhelming because all these people have come out to us, to see us finish, as I have come out here to see you start. And their message is the same as mine is to you, which was thank you. Thank you for the chance to move forward in life. What was that Give question? I'm Give sorry. Give it up for Bill Walton, everybody. Awesome, awesome. Come on! Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You're still on. So I believe we're going to move up there, and we're going to have a reception. Yes, we are. Okay. There's food and alcohol up there, so let's have a really good time and dream. But as I asked for your stories, because I need new stories, John Wooden, his endless search Pat Riley, the great teachers, Phil Jackson, Greg Popovich, the endless stories that you need to keep the values, the message, the lessons, they stay the same. But the delivery vehicle has to change on a constant basis. So my email address is bill.walton at billwalton.com. My phone number is 619-890-9085. If you don't hear back from me in 24 hours, just send it again with the title Second request, I thought you were cool. And <laughs> I need to hear from you. More importantly, we need to be together. We need to grow this organization. We need to drive this train all the way to the top.
Please, God, don't let me die. Don't take away our children's day. Live green or die. Solar energy, the biggest no-brainer in the history of the world. Thank you, GSA. Thank you, Sacramento. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Mayor. Here we go. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you, Bill Walton.